This is frightening. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. And our lead story to this major superpower will not survive what's coming in the next 90 days. And we're gonna witness in real time the destabilization of a major economy because I'm going to show you today how the foundation of the bedrock of their economy is fracturing in a major way. And 90 days from now, it's gonna be very apparent that things there are going wrong. And even worse, we're gonna make the case as their economy plummets into an abyss, how it will spread across the world. Of course, one of the problems right now are those behind it, as you'll soon see, are taking a victory lap. Plus, we have a sponsor for today's show. I'd like to introduce to you Briacell Therapeutics. You can find them on the NASDAQ and the symbol BCTX. And we're excited to have them as a sponsor because they just got fast track status by the FDA. And if you're a technical trader, you're going to love this chart setup because it's at a triple bottom. And in the past, when it comes off of this, the stock goes outright vertical, which is how I'm going to show you how you can trade this for a 19 to 40. 45% gain, which will be a huge boost to your trading account. Not to mention, there's two analysts that have major buy signals on this stock. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the pinned comment or description for more information. Now, let's head over to Bloomberg where we pick today's story up because I need you to set up the story from a global perspective. And then we're going to zoom into this country and I'm going to show you exactly how the foundation of their economy is coming unraveled. And with this headline, shipping chaos cast pal over global trade, according to Bloomberg Tracker. And we're hearing right now that the U.S. economy is the strong part of the world. And we're going to yank everybody up out of the slump. And yet from a trade perspective, things are looking worse as you're about to see. And if you want to know where the global economy is going, one of the best places to look is the trade sector. As 4 out of 10 gauges on the dashboard were below normal range in February, from just 3 at the start of the year as Taiwan's export orders plunged more than expected. As shipping volumes in Los Angeles slipped back into normal territory after showing positive reading, while port activity in Singapore and Hong Kong likely dropped. And what happens here is we're seeing a gradual slowdown coming out of the holiday season. Now, we expected to see some of this, but you have to remember, the political elites told us this was not going to happen, that the global economy was strong and it was resilient and it was rebounding. And yet we're seeing signs that the opposite now is happening. And this isn't a good indicator of where things are going in the future. Because sentiment is souring amid fears the improvement in global trade could be short-lived as Yemen's Houthi rebels steadily ramp up their attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. And that's double freight costs and lengthened delivery schedule at a time when inflation is yet to come down meaningfully and some intermediate goods are still experiencing shortages. This according to Moody's. Now, this is important because as we look around the world, what are we hearing about the U.S. economy right now is we're in somewhat of a renaissance phase. Factory activities picking up. Services sectors we'll look at later in the show is picking up a bit. And why is that? Because what's going on in the Red Sea is causing orders to come home because they're looking at the additional cost to produce goods here and saying, wait a minute, it's actually cheaper than going overseas and having them come on a ship that could be delayed and the cost to ship it just don't add up right now. The problem is this hiccup in the global economy because it's not getting resolved anytime soon, as you're going to see, is causing the bound foundation of a major economy to crack, fracture, and about to break apart. And while firms can absorb the higher prices for now, there are wider economic implications should the Red Sea become a non-viable trade route. Europe's car makers already face stiff competition from China in securing market share in Asia. Meanwhile, the latter's resilience on Europe for specialized machinery and chemicals means that significant disruptions could impair production in Asia's advanced manufacturing hubs, stretching inventories and leaving assembly lines idle. And that's exactly the problem here as we look over to Asia and say, wait a minute, they cannot handle any sort of slowdown here. But the argument, can producers absorb these higher prices? Well, for the moment, they can. As we look at the consumer price index here, less the producer price index by commodity for final demand. And we show the margins, at least on a year-on-year -year rate of change, are actually healthy enough. So yes, producers can absorb this. The only question remains is for how long 
because now as we get into our lead story, China's tumbling prices push some exporters to the brink. And this is a problem because underneath every major economy, no matter where you're at in the world, the labor market is critical. Now we continue to hear from the central elites that no matter where you look, the labor market is strong and healthy, and they were experts at bringing inflation down. We'll look at it a little bit why they're pr premature on their victory lap, but don't hold off. They're celebrating too much today because the challenge right now is China is facing the unthinkable. And when Chris Lin, who owns a lighting factory in China, received this year's first order from close overseas client, he faced a distressing choice. Take it at a loss or tell workers not to come back after the Lunar New Year. And he said it was impossible for me to lose this order. He plans to restart his factory in the eastern city of Taizhou at around half its capacity after the February 10th to 17th holiday break. Now keep in mind, half the factor, half the capacity. Well, if you're starting to think that may that means half the workers. Well, you got it. Prolonged factory deflation is threatening the survival of smaller Chinese exporters were locked in relentless price wars for shrinking business as higher interest rates abroad and rising trade protectionism squeeze demand. So I want you to understand what exactly we saw there is shrinking business. Now, when you're the world's largest exporter, the fact of the matter is when you hear shrinking business, it means demand from the rest of the world is slowing and declining. That is not a good sign because you need people to work or else, well, your whole economy is at risk. And producer prices have been falling for 15 straight months, crushing profit margins to the point where industrial Industrial output and jobs are now at risk, compounding China's economic woes, which include a property crisis and debt crunch, all of which we've said is likely to happen. But notably, the key part here as we look at this, where industrial output and jobs, more importantly, jobs are at risk, something here in the U.S. We don't hear anybody talking about that. We hear just the opposite about how strong the labor market here and how everyone is going to be getting a job really soon because we're at the beginning of the next bull market in stocks and the economy. But let's take a look here because as we see what's going on in China, where producer prices go. Now, keep in mind that back feeds into U.S. consumer prices as many goods with, that we buy every day are produced in China. And if they're fighting deflation and cutting prices to take what little is out there to keep those factories open, well, what it does is it ends up putting downward pressure on the U.S. consumer price index. Here you can see in blue against the China's producer price index in red. And sure enough, every time we see that, any hope that there's going to be a rebound inflation is dashed at best. And yet, what do we hear from central elites that are worried inflation's coming back? No sign as long as China's producer price index is in negative territory. Well, it's unlikely that we're going to see a resurgence in inflation anytime soon. Of course, when we talk about the labor market, well, we don't have a long history on the producer price index. So we're going to look at the consumer price index because we know final demand for PPI has a very high correlation to consumer prices. And we can say that, yes, indeed, the labor market in the U.S. comes unwound when we see consumer prices fall. So as we look at China and we see this entire industry of small factories looking on the brink of failure, it's going to put a lot of people on the unemployment line. Now, keep Keep in mind, China is trying to revive their property sector to keep their insolvent banks from failing. And if you have a whole bunch of workers hit the unemployment line, well, that means consumption and demand is going to fall even further. And at a certain point, there is no return to normal. They're on a path on the way down. And something that should be resuming its upward trend in the near future is continued claims. Here we see in red, you know, in the past, in the 70s and 80s, even into the 90s, that you would see continued claims rise as people at the unemployment line, but inflation wouldn't give up until later. Today, as we fast forward into the dot-com bubble, you see a much stronger relationship as continued claims rise. The consumer price index flattens out its growth and rolls down. You can even get some transitory increases like we did during the great global financial crisis where inflation due to oil continued to go higher but then came and turned into deflation now we have a relatively small increase in continued claims but the timing is a near mirror of the consumer price index's peak it's coming down continued claims likely to go higher over the longer term and maybe in the short term because of what's going on in the red sea demand will stay domestically and that will keep people
employed. We'll have to watch, of course, the future reports to see. One of the challenges is we still have nearly 2 million people on unemployment that have been on unemployment for a while. Their lack of paychecks will continue to weigh on domestic demand in a big way. And here we can see the chief China economist at ANZ says fixing deflation should be a higher prior policy priority than reaching the expected growth target of around 5% this year. Companies cut product prices, he says, then staff salaries. We've made this case before, then consumers won't buy. This could be a vicious cycle, and it is to the downside. It's therefore difficult to shrink supply, he said. No more effort should be made on the demand side this year. As factory owners say, the pressure to cut jobs is intense. Even if some are reluctant to do so, of course, they know if they start cutting jobs, demand is going to go down even more. Once you start an economy on a downward spiral, there is very little you can do to stop it until it comes crumbling to a halt. Then you can rebuild. The problem is the direction of China's economy is not good and Beijing is not responding. And here we can see this company who makes industrial use valves in the eastern city of Wenzhou said he had thought of shutting down the business, but he keeps it running as he feels indebted to his workers, most of whom are close to retirement age. Still, he doesn't know how long the factory can survive. And over the next 90 days, if there isn't a change in what's going on in the Red Sea and we don't see those pipelines open on global transport, then these factories in China, these small producers, they're going to go under. They're going to put people on the unemployment line. And then of what little work remains, the bigger suppliers are going to fight for it and continue to drive prices down and continue to put downward pressure, of course, around the world. Because we know, again, China exports deflation because this is all about the factory sector. doesn't matter whether you're in China, the U.S., or in Europe. It's all about the factory sector because when it goes, well, there goes your labor market, there goes your economy. And sure enough, as we look at the current general business activity for the Philly Fed manufacturing sector against continued claims, what we can see is slowdowns in manufacturing have a perfect relationship with continued claims as manufacturers lay off. Well, there's no demand. People stay on unemployment leads to further decline in manufacturing. You see that relationship over and over again. It doesn't matter how high the bar is where manufacturing gets to. What matters is a slowdown leads to putting people on the unemployment line. Right now, we keep hearing from manufacturers and employers that they want to hold on to employees. They're afraid to let too many of them go because they're buying in to the no landing scenario now. The problem is there's just too many people on the unemployment line. But will this get any central banker to change their view? Well, the OECD, OECD says, no, keep rates high. What are you talking about? No chance to cut because it's too soon to cry victory on inflation is according to the OECD as they tell other central bankers do not cut rates at any cost because it's too soon to be sure that the inflationary episode that they begin in 2021 will end in 2025. Monetary policy needs to remain prudent to ensure that underlying inflationary pressures are durably contained because we have no clue, they're saying, of how 1970s inflation worked. And we certainly don't understand how the monetary system or global economy works today. So rather than actually learn it and make adjustments accordingly, we're just gonna keep policy restrictive. But that's okay, because we found out from the Fed Chair Jerome Powell on Sunday, he would love more than anything to keep rates elevated because right now he's taking a huge victory lap and doesn't understand that at the heart of what he is doing is leading to the destabilization of China's small factory producers. We said this will eventually have knock-on effects. You see it start one place and then it spreads. Little does he know that the world is headed into a recession. But Powell tells 60 Minutes, Fed is wary of cutting rates too soon because, hey, we just are at the edge of declaring victory. In fact, he already started taking his victory lap on Sunday by saying the danger of moving too soon is that the job's not quite done and that they're really, the really good readings we've had over the last six months somehow turn out to be, well, not a true indicator of where inflation is heading, which is, well, pretty ridiculous when you think about it. We don't think that's the case, but the prudent thing to do is just to give it some time and see that the data continues to confirm that inflation is moving down to 2% in a sustainable way. Of course, the risk is, as we know, Know the Fed always does, they will overshoot their target, send, of course, many Americans on the unemployment line, but yet it hasn't happened. And because it hasn't happened yet, many people say it can't. But don't worry, 
It's coming soon because anytime you see a central bank restrict the creation of credit or new money flow into the economy by inverting the yield curve, well, that means banks don't lend as much. If banks aren't lending, that means they're not creating money. You can't sustain the growth or even the labor market of the economy because you've got a lot of debt to pay on. And sure enough, what we know is inflation is going to get down to its 2% target and probably overshoot it because the yield curve showing inverted in the red line anytime it's below the horizontal black line. Right now, the largest inversion since the 1980s when, of course, inflation came crumbling down. But we see every yield curve inversion leads to a decline or outright deflationary event in consumer prices this time being no different because again we have a high amount of debt load and big growth targets and not enough money to sustain any of it all but for a couple of our participants do believe it'll be appropriate too for us to begin to dial back the restrictive stance by cutting rates this year but we're not there yet and so it's certainly the base case that we will do that we're just trying to pick the right time, given the overall context. This is a real simple case of why they're hesitant, because they put the markers out there, they throw the economy back, and they think, well, we'll just leave it here a little bit longer, then we'll edge off and everything will smooth out. We'll hit our 2% target. The economy will continue to grow. We will be heroes, and we'll only need to drop the federal funds rate maybe you know, half a percent, or maybe you know, three quarters of a percent. The yield curve says you're going to be dropping it back to zero. Are you kidding me? Because you look at the mirror relationship between the federal funds rate and the yield curve. Again, that shown in red underneath the black line is when it's inverted. The longer, of course, it stays in inversion, the more the Fed is likely to cut. In this case, the Fed believes that they've done it. The first time in history that they're going to be able to engineer a no landing. Forget the soft landing. We beat that, and they're not going to have to cut. But the fact is, they've been at zero once, twice. Well, get ready the third time will eventually get here the cycle has not ended yet but because of what's going on in the red sea because china is struggling here we're going to see demand move domestically and that will keep the u.s economy looking good for a little while longer keep the fed with rates tighter than they need to be and here we have the evidence as the u.s services gauge rises to a four-month high while prices pick up. And sure enough, a gauge of new orders placed with service providers, a proxy of future demand, rose to a three-month high of 55, suggesting that there is a renaissance now in the services sector. Because last week, manufacturing data from the ISM showed an increase in bookings that measured to help push its overall index of factory activity closer to expansion. Again, this is the Red Sea effect as the group's measure of services employment rebounded 6.7 points Back to expansion territory at 50.5, which means service providers just aren't, they're not really hiring, they're not laying off. They're kind of a neutral point here, is all that means. And what we can see though, the service report showed stronger export growth and higher backlogs, mean the services sector likely gonna last a little longer, mainly due to the backlogs as a measure of sentiment about inventory levels rose, indicating response that their stockpiles are too high relative demand. So they've seen a slowdown in demand here, but what they do have is a problem with their backlog orders that will keep the employment rates in the services sector around a little while longer but if the global economy and the u.s economy do not continue to rebound the services sector will go along with the u.s manufacturing sector but one thing that we think we're super bullish on is that is the stock for our sponsor today bria cell therapeutics because they've got an answer to something that women have a problem with and as you're about to see there's a good reason why the fda has put them in fast track status and as i mentioned at the beginning of the show if you're a trader you're gonna love this chart setup hey it's saying tight because we'll talk about how you can leverage a trade with them from 19 to 45 percent huge boost to your portfolio again everything about brina cell linked in the description and pinned comment below is they're developing novel therapies to destroy cancer and this is something you can find on the nasdaq under the symbol bctx and they are a clinical stage immuno oncology company it is developing an entirely new class of targeted immunotherapies to transform cancer care and it doesn't matter if you're in a recession or not if there is an answer for cancer people will want it and they'll want it in a big way there's a reason why the fda is fast tracked this because under fda approval bria imt combination pivotal study designed in advanced metastatic breast cancer they've been awarded fast track status by the u.s fda is being evaluated in a pivotal phase three study for this disease so this is your opportunity 
to get into Bria cell before they have the results. Again, you can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol BCTX. And you're not the only, we're not the only ones who are bullish on this because HC Wainwright and Zach's small cap both have strong buys on the stock with price, tar price targets near 18 bucks, which would be a substantial price gain over where it's trading right now. We'll make the case of where the initial moves are before that happens. And here we can see that they are a lead drug candidate currently in phase three, which is a patented off the shelf cell based targeted immunotherapy that stimulates the patient's immune system to induce targeted killing of cancer cells. And they've just had this press release on January 4 that they confirm robust anti tumor activity in patient with eye bulging metastatic breast cancer. The significant reduction in metastatic breast cancer tumor behind the eye after only three cycles is powerful anti-tumor response associated with reduction in prothesis and reduced ocular pain. Heavily pretreated patient had failed seven prior regimens, including antibody drug, congelate therapy, and remains on Bria cell treatment today. This is huge. Again, you can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol BCTX. Now let's check out this triple bottom on the stock because this is something important that as you see a stock come down, what you want to see is heavy volume putting it into it. You see that here back in October, it bounced off that, took a massive 45% gain, pulled back. Sellers came back again and look, once again, volume came in put a halt to that decline, and bam, another 45% gain off the bottom, and now it's pulled back again. We're look for here for more big players to step in, but this is your opportunity to get in at a bottom point. A move up to the first supply zone here, you see we have where the prior sellers have been at. That's 19% move all the way back up here. As we make the case, the stock tends to do, that'd be a 45%. Talk about making a year for your trading account in one trade. This is what Breeze Cell could potentially do. As we zoom in, you can see the volume profile line at $4.20. That's where, of course, the buyers underneath continue to step in and break through these sellers. And next thing you know, this stock is going vertical. And of course, as always, with any company we feature on the show, you're under no obligation to purchase their stock. However, you can check out Briacell under the NASDAQ symbol BCTX and in the description and pinned comment below because as I mentioned, not only do you're under no obligation, be sure to do your own research before placing any trades. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.